Gentlemen, my name is Brad Thompson, and I'm the executive director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. And I would like to welcome you to our John W. Pope lecture series. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the sponsor of the event, the John W. Pope Foundation, which has generously supported this lecture series for over a decade. And now a word about the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. The Clemson Institute is America's premier academic center dedicated to exploring the moral foundations of capitalism. As many of you know, the Clemson Institute is also the home of the Lyceum Program, which is recognized now as one of America's most prestigious academic programs, providing a great books education in philosophy, literature, history, and politics. One of the great pleasures of my job is that every now and then I get to in introduce a friend. And in this case, I'm introducing one of my oldest and closest friends. Lauren J. Sammons is professor of classical studies at Boston University, where he has taught ancient history and classical languages for the last 30 years. He is best known to Lyceum students as the chief academic advisor and executive director of the, of the Institute for Hellenic Culture and Liberal Arts at the American College of Greece. Professor Sammons is one of the world's leading authorities on classical Greece, focusing on fifth century Athenian history and politics. He is the author of many important and influ influential books, including Pericles and the Conquest of History, What's Wrong with Democracy, Empire of the Owl, Athenian Imperial Finance, and Athens from Cleisthenes to Pericles. I have known Professor Sammons for 37 years when we started graduate school together at Brown University. Now, I have been racking my brain all week to think of something that I could say that would embarrass Professor Sammons publicly, knowing that he would undoubtedly do the same to me if given the same opportunity. But the problem is that all of the really good dirt that I have on him almost, invo almost always involves me as a co-conspirator. So I think it's best for me just to shut up and get him up here and turn him over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to Clemson University my dear friend and brother in arms, Professor Lauren J. Sammons. I'm not going to beat that. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here uh, and to see my old and dear friend Brad Thompson again and to thank him for inviting me. This is not the first time he's invited me to Clemson, but it's the first time that I've ever had to sing for my supper, as it were. Um, and uh, I'll just say, I was going to mention 37 years. You've already put that on the table. It was almost exactly 37 years ago when we met in a, our first day of our PhD program at Brown University. And uh, I'll just say that our friendship has been one for me that's been both professionally, personally, and intellectually satisfying, uh, particularly because you know you've probably heard people say, never let disagreement get in the way of friendship. Uh, but Brad is definitely someone who believes never let friendship get in the way of disagreement. And I think we share that quality. Um, I, I'll just thank the Clemson Institute as well, and especially the students of the Lyceum program, because I have met many of them in Athens uh, over the last several years. Um, and I thank uh, Adam, Professor Thomas, for introducing uh, me to so many of these great students. In fact, although I've been working on this topic for about 20 years, I had never actually given a lecture on it until uh, uh, Professor Thomas asked me, will you speak to the, to the Lyceum students? And I thought, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about this thing that I've been pondering all these years. And it's sort of going to be a book eventually, but you know, how, how, how fast can you write a book? I mean, 20 years, give me a break here. I had other things to do. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is, is why Athens, and it's not why Athens, Georgia. Someone was asking about that before the lecture. Of course, that question is, who knows? But, um, <laughs> but why Athens, uh, Greece? 
Um, and the problem that we face um, is a fairly obvious one that in the fifth century and fourth century BC, between let's say about 500 and 350 BC, Athens produced as many cultural masterpieces as any European nation state over the same period uh, in modern history. And I'll take any nation state you want to put up. You want to give me France in the 16th and 17th century, England in the 18th and 19th century. I'll, I'll take on all comers. But Athens did this, I mean, and they did it in art, they did it in philosophy, they did it in art, in, in architecture, literature, full stop. And they did it with a population, a citizen population of about 30 to 50,000 people. That's the citizen population, okay? That's about the size of Clemson when the students are here. When y'all are here, okay? There's about 30,000 people here. That's about the citizen population. So we've got other people who aren't citizens in Athens and a full population of maybe 200 to 250, maybe even 300,000 people. But the citizen population is very, very small by uh, any kind of modern standards. And most scholars have talk, who have talked about this over the last 100 years or so have noticed that while Athens was doing this, she also controlled an empire which dominated other Greek states and, and the Athenians profited from that empire. Of course, they were doing other things like defeating the Persians too, but they were also creating the first democracy in the, mod, in the Greek world, a phenomenon, of course, that's ramified uh, throughout history. Uh, and typically over the last 75 or 100 years, the answer to why did all this stuff develop in Athens has usually been because of democracy or sometimes because of democracy and empire. Um, but you will see immediately that those two things, democracy and empire, which de develop in the fifth century are like this amazing cultural phenomenon, products of something that came before. Uh, uh, Professor Thompson and I have uh, a great friend from that same class at, at Brown University, Brendan McConville, who likes to say that the problems with the 18th century are the 17th century. You know, there's a thing called chronology. This is a great theory that is much uh, uh, underappreciated in modern history. If you're going to explain 5th century Athens, you probably have to look in the 6th century. And so well, that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to do today is look in the century before Athens produced things like the Parthenon and Greek tragedy, uh, the things that you, know, you hear about from Athens. What was going on just before this? Now, if you're trying to explain a cultural phenomenon, there's several different ways you can go about it, and one will be environment. You know, look at the geography, look at the climate, look at the uh, uh, local influences, uh, material factors. This has very, been very prompt, pr popular in the 20th century, where, of course, economics be, ends up being the explanation for a whole lot of historical phenomena. Um, until it stops being that. that. Um, and then there are the, the elements that the Greeks were most interested in, which is, is something like custom or law. That is, the, the way that human beings make their environment. The Greeks called this nomos, all right? That's translated custom or law. What we do to the environment intellectually, politically, socially to change it. How do we organize ourselves to worship? How do we organize ourselves to choose leaders, et cetera? And then the third uh, possible explanation for something like Athens would be nature, uh, what the Greeks called phusis, all right? Phusis is something inherent. It's inherent in the physical world, but it's also inherent in human beings. You know, is it possible that human beings themselves or particular human beings have something inside them that makes them tend in a certain direction? And this was a very popular explanation of things in the ancient world. Uh, a Greek historian like Thucydides, for example, as you're going to see, is very interested in this question of nature, of human nature, of the nature of states, the nature of populations. But in the world of the academy today, this is not something that's generally discussed. It, in fact, it's a subject that's off the table. Uh, modern historians are really interested in the first two things almost exclusively. What's the environmental factors that could lead to a certain situation? And what is the custom or law? What kind of society did they create? And the question of nature is taken off the table. But I put it to you that the question of nature can't be taken off the table. And that in this case, although as with most historical phenomena, the answer is going to involve all three of those things, environment, the, the um, uh, custom or law and nature, that you can't take nature off the table and nature needs to be put back onto the table if we want to try to explain why certain states act in certain ways. So if we want to explain why Athens, the first thing we have to ask is why Greece? You know, what made Greece such an unusual place in the fifth and fourth centuries BC? And as I was drinking a, uh, a coffee before I came over here, I thought, well, you know, 
Salmon, do you think you're talking about you know, Greece as a success and you know, the, the efflorescence of the Greek world? Or you know, what do you really mean by success? You know, what, how do we define success in a society? So I just thought, jotted down five things here. You know, maybe you can come up with some others that we could talk about in the question period. But I'm going to put these five on the table. One is a relatively high standard of living. And in the Greek world, that means the emergence of a middle class, middle class property owners, all right, which were a new phenomenon in the Near Eastern world, as far as we can tell. All right. Second, literacy, a relatively high level of literacy. Third, independence and self-government. That is, you're able to su sustain your independent self-government and prevent other states from dominating you. Four is something like aesthetics, beauty, literature, art, a beautiful environment physically and intellectually. And then fifth, something like thought slash science, technology, the creation of new knowledge. And I think if you look at those five things, nobody would deny that the Greek world in the fifth century BC meets, that, meets those standards of success, as well as any society in the ancient or medieval world, and I would say as well as any society even in the modern world. And you, can, you can challenge me on that. I'll be happy to, 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 to answer the challenge if I can. So that's what I mean by, by success, all right? Now, that aesthetic piece, the, the ability to create beauty and the ability to create thought, right? These are the things that we tend to focus on when we think about the ancient Greek world. I'm probably going to focus on them more today. But I want to keep that whole picture in mind. Literacy, a middle class of property owners that actually control their own destiny. Okay, we're talking about people who go into an assembly like you are now and together make a decision about whether they're going to go to war or not. That happened all over the Greek world. We think that's democracy, right? Voting to, about whether you're going to go to war or not. The Greeks did not think that was democracy. That didn't make you democratic because every Greek city-state did that. Sparta did it. Corinth did it. Thebes did it. Argos did it. A sovereign assembly of citizens who decide whether they're going to go to war or not is just a function of Greece after about 750 BC. There's nothing unusual about it. In the Greek world, it's really unusual when you step outside of Greece. Okay? Um, and, and, and I think there's a way in which this re relates very closely to the fact that you've got a bunch of middle class uh, property owners who are necessary for the defense of the state. You know, Greek warfare was based largely on the fact that you've got to get as many armed men together as possible, and those guys have to be armed in a certain way. They have to have a helmet, a shield, a spear. They should have a breastplate, maybe have greaves. Those things are expensive, and nobody's going to give them to you. The state isn't going to give them to you. You have to earn them. So you see that you've got to have a little surplus wealth to buy that stuff, right? And so these guys, who we might think of as middle class people, say people who are able to afford a car, all right? They're the most important people from a certain perspective for any of these Greek city-states because when another Greek city-state attacks, you've got to have as many of these guys as possible. You've got to put them into the field. So you see there's an incentive to have as many of these independent property-owning characters, and they're almost all farmers, all right? As many of these guys as you can have, there's a natural incentive there for that kind of organization based on this military environment uh, of the Greek world. But what else makes Greek so unusual? Greece so unusual. Well, it's not in the East and it's not in the West. You can't think of Greece as Europe in the ancient world. And you can't think of it as just the Near East. But if you're going to choose between the two, you've got to choose the Near East. Okay? Because in 500 BC, nobody in the, in the known world where people were writing and thinking and creating new technologies cared about Europe. Okay? It did not matter. It was a cold, scary, dark place. They made good swords up there, and that's about it. Okay? The people that mattered were from Greece to the uh, east and south. That's where the great civilizations were. That's where the stone architecture was. That's where writing systems were. That's where everything interesting, basically, had happened up to that point. And Greece is on the northwest edge of that world, in contact with that world of Europe, but very much a part of that eastern world of literature and, and uh, great kingdoms of, uh, of, of literacy, of international um, trade, where in Greece you can get things from uh, uh, Afghanistan and Cornwall. Tin, for example, that's necessary to make bronze. Greece is a part of this world. Greece is always, and today even so, it sits in this really weird topographical place where it's both east and west. And when you visit Athens today, and you drive down Messalion Street, and you see the American embassy there, 
you will see that the American embassy is incredibly large by any rational standard, okay? Compared with other embassies in countries the size of Greece, and you'll say, well, wow, why is the American embassy in Greece so big? And the reason is it is full of spies. All right, it's the launching spot for everything that America is doing in that region is Athens. So for example, when we pulled the ambassador out of Ukraine, he went to Athens, surprise, okay, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the middle, in the late 20 teens. Um, east and West, it's an incredibly interesting place where you're getting influences from all over the place, but especially the East. One of those influences from the East, maybe the most important the Greeks ever took, was the system of writing that the Phoenicians gave to Greece. Or gave to Greece, I don't know if they gave it to them, but the Greeks took it, all right. So sometime around 750 BC or so, we really don't know exactly when this happened, some Greek or Greeks took, looked at the Phoenician system of writing and said, that's really interesting. The Greeks couldn't write at that point, okay? They had had a system of writing hundreds of years before. It had been lost. But they looked at the Phoenician system of writing and they said, maybe we could use that and adapt it to our own language. Now the Phoenician system of writing, like almost all systems of writing in antiquity, was based just on consonant sounds. Sometimes systems were based on syllables, consonants, and vowels. But usually this Phoenician system is just like, a, it's a consonant system, like ancient Hebrew, okay. But the Greeks looked at the Phoenician system and said, well, there's look, 25, 26, 27 characters here. We don't need all those characters. We don't have that many consonant sounds in Greek. We've got some leftover letters here. Why don't we use these leftover letters to express the vowel sounds? Now, that may sound like an incredibly obvious idea, but it wasn't obvious to anybody until somebody in Greece did it. But you see that it changed what writing could do immediately. Because writing up to that point had been used largely to remind you of something, right? If you got something in a jar and you put olives in there, right, you put the symbols for olives on the top of that jar. Now, since you don't have vowels, it's going to be an L and a V, or maybe an S, all right? And so you've got to remember, L, V, S, what did I put in there? Olives, oh yeah, right, this is the jar of the olives in it, okay? That is, writing is largely a memory system, or a, 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 a memory induction system. What makes using vowels so amazing is that all of a sudden you can project words to people who have never read those words before and don't know what those words are. They don't have to know anything about what's happened. You can actually project information across space and across time to people who have never read those words before. Because just as when you were in the first grade and they told you to sound out the word, right? you can sound out the word if you have the vowels and the consonants. If you just have the consonants, you're in trouble. Right? You don't know if you're looking at cat or cut or cot. Right? What's in this jar? Is it a cat? Hmm? I hope it's a cot. The cats are going to make too much noise. Right? So this is a really, really simple thing. But there are, there are people who've argued this is the greatest technological advance in the history of mankind. Because everybody used it. Once the Greeks came up with it, almost everyone realized what an incredible, this is why we're using an alphabet today, an alphabet right, alphabet, which is alpha, a vowel, and beta, a consonant. That's what makes the alphabet so amazing. And the one we use now is just an adaptation of the ones the Greeks adapted. I've talked about the uh, soldiers before, the middle class soldiers, farmers. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. But I, I will just say this. Keep in mind that that idea of we need as many of these citizen soldiers as possible is a strong drive to a kind of egalitarian idea that these guys all have the vote, okay? They have an equal say in a certain way. And this idea of equality is extremely strong within Greek culture. But it is not so strong that it crushed another idea, which was anti-equality. And that is an idea of excellence. What classicists are, use the ancient Greek word arete, arete in modern Greek. Arete, which means in its root, excellence. Right? An idea that everything has an excellence. Anything that has a job, that has an ergon, that has a task, that thing has an excellence. The excellence of a knife is that it cuts well. The excellence of a pen is that it writes well. What is the excellence of a human being? That's the question that Greeks were fascinated by. And they had all kinds of different answers to it. They answered it differently over hundreds of years of study. But what they never denied was that there was something that made a human being excellent. And, and therefore, there was a way to look at one human being and say, this one is more excellent than that one. So you could call that an aristocratic principle or a meritocratic principle in Greek culture. They, the, the idea of equality is right there. And the idea that we are not equal 
and some of us are more excellent than others, how are we going to rate those things? The contest, the struggle to show your excellence, what the Greeks call the agon, which gives us agony, the pain you feel in struggle, this is a, a root part of, Greek, uh, of the Greek culture. Two other things. In Asia Minor around, uh, between about 575 and 500 BC, Asia Minor, the west coast of Asia Minor, which was fully Greece at that time, you, you should think of Greece as the area around the Aegean Sea, not as what we think of as Greece today, but the area around the Aegean Sea with Greeks inhabiting all that area, all that coastal area, those islands, etc. That eastern part of the Greek world, which is what is today Turkey and the coast of Asia Minor, the Greeks called that Ionia. And a group of Greeks emerged there in, that, in those 500s of BC that were asking questions about what the world is made of. That is, they, what is the stuff? What's this stuff? What are we? What's the physical world made of? And this was one of the first questions they began to put to their own minds and to seek an answer from the human mind. That is, they were practicing a rational approach to addressing the world. Now, I would use the word humanism to describe this. Humanism is that system of belief, for me, the way I'm going to define it, is that human beings can ask and answer the most important questions. This is what the Greeks believe. We can both ask the question, we can figure out what the question is, and then we can answer it using only the human mind. We won't look to the outside somehow to answer that question. The question can be answered through reason. And the Greeks developed this system of thought in the 500s BC, and it was extremely influential. I mean, it suddenly opened up a whole world for asking, okay, well, what are the stars made of? What is this earth made of? What are we made of? Is there some substance that everything is made of? And sometimes the answer is where everything is basically water, or everything is basically fire, or everything is made up of something that has no qualities whatsoever. Starts to sound like string theory somehow. Right? Everything can be reduced to something, right? Can it? Um, and, and this led to asking questions like, well, can we rationally determine what the Persians are like? Or what the Egyptians are like? Or maybe what are we, Greeks, like? That is, the Greeks started asking questions about culture because of a rational interest in what these things are and how they can be defined and what that knowledge might do for them. If the Persians are invading every once in a while, you know, you might want to find out what the Persians are actually like. And the final thing I want to put on the table for why Greece was so unusual is one that I don't think very many people talk about today um, in the Greek world, but in some ways I think it's the most important. It's the resistance to dualism. Now, what is dualism? Dualism is a system of thought that says the whole, all of existence can basically be divided up into things that are good and things that are evil. And the good things are associated with light and spirit and knowledge and intelligence. And the bad things are associated with the physical world, the body, often sex, okay? Dualism has its, its origins probably in Persia, we don't know, but this system of thought that there's evil and there's good, and the evil has certain qualities and the good has other qualities, and that the, the way you get through life most effectively is to spend your time dividing the evil from the good and making sure you're on the side of the good and not on the side of evil. Now you will see immediately that we, are in, we live in a world right now where dualism has retaken over that most people today, at least the people in the West, are living in a world where they say, well, tell me who the bad guys are, and I want to be on the good side. And that's it. There's just the good guys and the bad guys. If you got the wrong flag in your account, you're a bad guy. All right? We're not going to even talk to you. We're going we to cancel you. We don't want to hear from you. There's not going to be any conversation between the evil and the good. They have to be separate. They have to be separated. Well, that idea of thought was extremely popular in the ancient world. It was even popular in the medieval world. It's an idea that keeps trying to get back into the West. And the Mediterranean world, classical world, and the Christian world, and the Hebrew world, let's just call it the Judeo-Christian world, rejected it. And you might be saying, well, that sounds a lot like this certain religion to me. But I put it to you, it's only a religion that has accepted this dualist idea because the classical Greeks ex rejected it out of hand because they didn't believe that the physical world was evil. They thought the physical world was good. The physical world is interesting and good and beautiful, and our bodies are interesting and good and beautiful, and sex is interesting and good and beautiful, all right? 
And then when we hear about this other idea, we're going to try to take this thing away. Now, this idea is always trying to get in. And it's quite attractive because you see it provides a really easy way for thinking about the world. Right? Doesn't it? And in Christianity, uh, well, uh, you know, if you think of the Old Testament, right? If you think of Judaism, the first lines of Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, a good dualist will reject that immediately because there's no way you can have a good God who actually creates the physical world. The physical world is necessarily evil. And so dualists often went so far to, talk, to say the God of the Old Testament is the God of evil, and we need some other divine force to create this universe in which we live. Okay. Um, well, you might think, what about Christianity, uh, uh, Professor Sandlin? all right. You know, Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. Now, why are those things in the Nicene Creed? Because there were a bunch of dualists running around saying that guy Jesus was definitely not a physical person and he definitely didn't die because if he's not a physical person, he can't die. He didn't have a real body. He just seemed to have a real body. He was just a spirit. And the Christian idea was you have to have the physical body because, hey, you need the blood and the body of Christ. The physical body is necessary to Christianity. So Mediterranean, the Mediterranean world of thought, whether it was classical or Christian or Jewish, was rejecting this idea of dualism. And we've been, the, the West has been trying to reject it for 2,000 years with more or less success, not very much success right now, I would say. So now we put Athens in this world, in this particular world, right? And how are we going to explain how Athens is different from the rest of these Greek states? And, you know, the most recent answer to this popular answer, written by a very eminent scholar, I'll do my best not to name him, uh, is that what you, the really way you can express Athens is that Athens had a lot of small uh, bodies within the state where people met and discussed things and voted and they learned how to be rational, fair decision makers. That Athenians on the neighborhood level and on the tribe level learned how to be rational, fair decision makers. And that meant when they went to the assembly and they made decisions as citizens, they made rational, fair decisions and they became an amazingly successful, prosperous city state as a result of that. Now, that sounds great. This is, a, this is a, an adaptation of the democracy is responsible for the success of Athens argument. You will see that immediately with a nice little twist on it. Okay. But there's a problem with this uh, 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 thesis, and it is the following. Tell me when the Athenians made a rational decision. Because if you start to look at the history of Athens over the years that Athens was a democracy, let's say from 500 to 323 BC, you will be hard pressed to find a major foreign policy de de decision that can be classified as rational. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, the Athenians, after they had fought the Spartans for 10 years between 431 and 421, all right, and rejected peace offers by the Spartans. They rejected peace offers by the Spartans before the war began. They rejected peace offers during the war. They rejected the Spartans' offer of alliance during the war. For 10 years, Athens fought Sparta, with Pericles at the beginning of this war driving them, in my opinion, into this war. All right. um, they finally made a peace treaty in 421 that was basically, we'll just go back to the way it was beforehand. All right, 10 years of war, but we'll go back to the way things were beforehand. That's the year 421. Three years later, three years later, some Athenian got up in the Athenian assembly and made the following proposition. You know, Argos, which is Sparta's bitter enemy, wants us to come down there and help them against Sparta. I move that we do that. And the Athenians voted to go along with that. We'd just been fighting Sparta for 10 years. Now we're going to pick up and go down and fight the Spartans again with the Argives. The Spartans, the Argives, by the way, had lost to Sparta every 30 years for the last century, basically. All right. There was no tradition of winning in Argos when it came to Sparta. But the Athenians, somebody said, let's go do that. Let's go fight the Spartans again. Wasn't it three years ago that the war? No, no, let's go. 418. They go down, they fight the Spartans at the Battle of Mantinea, and what happens? They lose. Okay, big shock, Athens loses an infantry battle against Sparta. Most predictable thing in the history of the ancient world. Yeah? So now it's 418. 416, two years after that, 
Somebody stands up in the Athenian assembly and says, you know, there's a little island way down in the south of the Aegean Sea here called Milos. What's, what's, what do they have on Milos? Not much. Uh, obsidian, well, it's, you know, it's not the Stone Age man anymore. We're not using that stuff. Yeah, well, still, what do they have? Uh, raisins, okay, raisins and obsidian. Little tiny island. But I think we should go down there and conquer it and force it into our empire. Somebody must have stood up and said, hey, uh, chucklehead, do you remember that uh, Milos is, a, Sparta, is a, a colony of Sparta? Sparta, were you at Mantinea two years ago? You remember that treaty we made with the Spartans? Somehow the Athenians voted to do this anyway. Right, let's take our fleet and force Milos, which had nothing Athens could possibly want, except they weren't in the empire. So the Athenians go to Milos, and they force the Melians into the empire. And the Melians make a speech. This is in the historian Thucydides. The Melians say, why are you doing this to us? It's unjust. We're, we're even neutral. And the Athenians say, it doesn't matter, right? Of men we know and gods we believe that by a necessary law of their nature, they rule wherever they can. Men rule wherever they can. We didn't make that rule up. We're just using it now. Sorry, you're going to join us. And the Melians resisted, and the Athenians destroyed the city. They killed the men and enslaved the women and children. That's 416, okay? Now, amazingly enough, the Spartans didn't do anything. So what? The Athenians went back home and said, thank God we got away with that Melos thing. That was good. No. 415, somebody gets up and says, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we sail to, to, to Sicily and attack Syracuse? Same guy probably stood up and went, hey, Sicily, you know that Syracuse is an ally of Sparta, right? It's a colony of Corinth, Dorian city-state, ally of Sparta. Were you at Mantinea? What? Nope, they see Athenians vote. Let's do that. Let's load everybody up in the ships. Let's sail all the way to Sicily and attack Sicily, an ally of Sparta. And then after they did that, for good measure, they attacked Sparta itself. All right. They started sailing around the Peloponnese and attacking Spartan holdings. Just, right? Come on, Sparta. Now, maybe, look, I could ramify, I mean, I could expand these examples all evening. I won't. But, but I just put it to you, finding a rational choice by the Athenians. Could we start there? If we're going to say that rational decision-making and fair processes is the reason that Athens was so great, can we start with one rational decision by the Athenians? That's all. Only right one. Now, you might say that when the Athenians voted to, um, well, actually, I, don't want to, I want to spoil that one. I'm going to hold back. I may have a rational vote for you, all right? I may. Maybe you'll have one for me in the questions. Um, okay. Athens in the 6th century, in the 500s that we're thinking about, was not the Athens we come to know. Athens was a second tier at best place in the 500s. Okay? It wasn't Sparta, it wasn't Argos, it wasn't Corinth, it wasn't Miletus, it wasn't Thebes. It was a lesser city-state that was on the fringe of the important Greek world. A moderate-sized place, moderate importance. And the Athenians, I put it to you, felt this very uh, uh, um, acutely. But how did, how did Athens even get to be a moderately important city-state in the 500s? Athens is a really weird place by Greek standards. If you, if you look at a map of Greece, all right, ancient Greece, the, the area that is called Athens is a really large area. In fact, it's, it's, it's roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. All right, that's extremely large by ancient Greek city-state standards. I know what you're thinking. It's as big as Rhode Island, but are there as many donut shops there? And the answer is no, there are But Professor Thompson knows what I'm talking about. Anyway, all right. He ate a lot of donuts in graduate school, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> what else would you do? Anyway, it's very, very large. And you know, scholars treat this as, a, as sort of a non-problem. You know, no other city-state in the Greek world had a, a, an area the size of, of Rhode Island. And so what that meant was, if you lived in Marathon, in the region of Attica, which is part of Athens. If you lived at Marathon, now you know how far Marathon is from the city of Athens. It's 26 miles, because that's how long a Marathon race is, all right? So 26 miles, you live in the city of Marathon. And to vote, you have to go 26 miles to Athens to vote. Now, how often are you going to do that? You're a hard-working farmer. How often are you just going to leave your farm and schlep it 26 miles into Athens so you can cast a vote? You might go if war with Sparta is the answer, but you know how that's going to go anyway, so maybe you're not even going to go in for that. 
How did Marathon become part of the political city of, At of the center of Athens? And I put it to you that this process was almost certainly not peaceful. That is, Athens incorporated all these other areas. Athens was an extremely aggressive city-state from the moment we can see it over the historical horizon. But it's dominating its neighbors. Instead of sending out colon colonies the way most other Greek city-states did, the Athenians concentrated on dominating the space around them and incorporating it, even to the point of incorporating the island of Salamis just off the coast of uh, Athens, which they did around uh, 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 500 uh, BC. In other words, Athens has a history of aggression and the attempt to establish its hegemony that goes back from the moment Athens appears over the historical horizon. What we see is Athenians attacking, all right, and incorporating and ruling, something we don't see with other Greek city-states, which tended to march out, have a battle, make a new border, and go home, all right, and see you in 30 years, we'll do it all over again. Okay? This is not the Athenian approach, which is one of incorporation, hegemony, and domination. Second, um, around 594 BC, the Athenians had a series of reforms instituted by Solon. Everybody's heard the name Solon of Athens. Solon of Athens, the laws of Solon. Solon's reforms, Solon's laws were the most important laws for the Athenians throughout their period, even though, throughout uh, the classical period, even though Solon wasn't responsible for democracy, but the Athenians so loved him and his laws that they associated him with democracy, and they called things Solon's laws even when they knew they weren't Solon's laws. Think of the way we call things constitutional that aren't actually in the Constitution. Right? One of the ways you win an argument right, is to say to somebody, well, of course, that's constitutional, or that's not constitutional. Well, you know, separation of church and state, that's, 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 that's a constitutional principle. Well, it's not actually in the Constitution. Well, it's constitutional, though. What do you mean by that? Yeah? The Athenians did the same thing with Solon. They would say, as Solon says in his laws, but the law was passed a year ago. Yes, but still, it's constitutional, right? It's Solon's laws. Solon looms very large in the Athenian consciousness, and I'm not going to go through his whole all program of reforms, but one thing I really important for the Institute for the Study of Capitalism right, is that Solon took birth off the table in terms of the way you advanced in society and replaced it with wealth. So how do you become eligible to hold the highest offices in the Athenian state? Up to Solon's time, it had been you had to be born into certain families. There's no way to get around this. You've got to be in these particular families to hold these offices. And Solon swept that away and said, no. As long as you can produce this much wealth, you can get into those offices. Now, that seems kind of backwards to us. We think, well, associating with wealth, with status, you know, that, that makes us very uncomfortable. I mean, we would, we would hate the idea, for example, what if the Senate of the United States was full of a bunch of millionaires? You know, that would make us really uncomfortable. We would say, what have we done wrong? Something has gone horribly wrong here. If only rich people... Wait a minute. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but you see that from Solon's perspective and from the Greeks' perspective, this is quite a radical change. If you, can get your, if you can get enough property and you can get a farm that's successful enough, you can rise to the highest level of political status in the Greek state. And I put it to you, this is one of the things that opened up Athens and it just unleashed a kind of, 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 of potential power in the state. And that's a, a, um, a, a phenomenon that will happen over and over again in Athenian history. Third, the Athenians had a really successful period of tyranny. Wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, in the five, from about 561 to about 511, the Athenians were ruled by a particular family called the Pisistratids, off and on, it's true. But then the center of that period was a long, successful period of dominance by a single man and his sons, which later Athenians felt very uncomfortable about because the truth was they really liked it. The problem with the tyrants in the 6th century in Athens is that if you really started looking at them, you ended up saying good things about them. The historian Thucydides says they had more excellence, arete. They ruled with as much excellence, arete, as anyone. Herodotus, another historian, says they didn't even change the existent laws, and it was a golden age under the Pisistratids. Now, why would there be this? There was also a negative tradition about, about these Athenian tyrants, which got stronger and stronger and stronger as the years went on. But something happened under that tyranny, and it was things like this. Athens became a kind of modern, if you can think of it that way, Greek city-state, stone construction. Okay? The Athenians started building nice, beautiful stone buildings like other Greek city-states had. 
Yeah? Centralization of authority that resulted in things like an, an enlarged festival for Athens called the Panathenaea, where the Athenians invited Greeks from all the rest of Greece to come to Athens and celebrate, listen to Homeric poetry, admire how great Athens was becoming. Athens is projecting itself and its power out there. It's, it's making itself heard, yeah? And, and the Athenians like this. Um, and they also like the fact that it seems to me um, I mean, the, the tyrants were a kind of champion for the lower classes in Athens, meaning the people whose citizenship was maybe in question. And if you can get the tyrant to support your citizenship, you're going to be recognized as a citizen. And this is suggested by various uh, events after the tyrants are overthrown. Um, 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 but, the, but the one other thing I, I want to put on the table is that the idea of public wealth seems to emerge out of this period of tyranny. And that may seem backwards to you. Why would we, why'd public wealth come from tyrants? I mean, what is public wealth, after all? What is money that belongs to the public? What is wealth that belongs to the public? Won't it go to the public? Well, it looks like that under the tyrants, the Athenians began to exploit the silver mines in southern Attica. And Athens was one of the only places in the Greek world there were three, only places where there was a substantial amount of wealth in the ground, where you could dig silver out of the ground and make money. And during the tyranny, I put it to you, it is almost certain that the tyrants took over those mines and took over the production of silver. Well, why is that important? Because when the tyrants were thrown out or when they left, that silver became public. The Athenians didn't give it back to the people who'd owned that property. The people who'd owned those mines never got them back. That money became public money, and the Athenians began distributing it to the public. I mean, isn't that what public money should do, distribute it to the public? I mean, that's what happens today, right? You go to Fort Knox once every six months, and they give you your gold bar, because it's public funds, right? It's not being kept from us, it's public. Now, that's another idea. Those silver mines, um, I think, play one of the most important roles in why Athens is such a different place. It just wasn't something you could do in the rest of the Greek world, literally dig you know, wealth out of the ground. And so there's a period there from the end of the tyranny around 510 BC to 483 BC, about 25, 27 years, where the Athenians were getting paid public money out of the mines every year. You can imagine how popular this was. You, know, you didn't have to do anything but be a citizen. You're going to get stuff, right? It's just coming to you. Fantastic. And in 483 BC, an Athenian stood up. Here's my maybe rational vote for you, all right, right now. 483 BC, an Athenian named Themistocles got up in the assembly and he said, hey, we just had a big mine strike this year. We've got a bunch of extra silver. You guys are about to get a big fat check, every one of you. How much? Pretty much a month's pay. A little less, all right? Every one of you. But I propose that we don't give you that money, and I propose that we build a huge fleet with that money. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my month's pay. And I'm sure a lot of Athenians did too, and they were used to this. But Themistocles convinced the Athenians that there's two enemies out there. One of them is Aegina, this island Aegina off the coast of, 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 of Attica. And then there are the Persians. And the Persians had been here a few years ago. Remember the Battle of Marathon, 490 BC? That was only seven years ago. We had to fight the Persians off. Well, I bet you they're going to come back. So we need a larger fleet to protect ourselves from these kinds of invasions. And the Athenians voted in 483-2 to give up that money and to build that fleet. Athens became a superpower overnight in the year 483-2 because the Athenian people voted not to accept those public payments and to build a fleet. It's the only time in Athenian history uh, from this point on when the Athenians vote not to pay themselves. And you won't be surprised, I suspect, that that money, which was turned into fleet money after this, there's no record of the Athenians ever having been paid from the mines again. That is, it just seems, you know, 483-2, we built the fleet. You think you go back in 482-1, and you're like, well, we're going to get our month's pay this year, right? Doesn't seem so. Well, we only voted to, I don't know what happened, but now the public money is not ours. That silver is flowing into Athens' military system. For it, it's the fundament of the Athenians' empire, is this wealth that they used to build this giant fleet, which they then used to repress other Greek city-states. Yes, they used it to defeat the Persians, too. And Herodotus says, without the Athenians' fleet, we wouldn't ever have defeated the, the Persians. So keep that in mind. We need that fleet for uh, defeating the Persians. Three more things. Um, 
now we're going to get kind of psychological here. The Athenians come from this branch of Greeks called Ionians. Okay, I talked about in Asia Minor, the Ionian Greeks. These are ethnic groups. The, the Greeks thought of them as real different ethnicities. Okay, they had different dialects. You could understand, if you're an Ionian Greek, you could understand a Dorian Greek, but he sounded weird to you. All right? You know, like maybe you're trying to understand a Scotsman. Right? It's kind of quaint and you get maybe three out of five words or whatever. But you know he's speaking English, but it's, it's tough. Or maybe just imagine somebody from Arkansas. All right. I'm from Arkansas. I can say that. All right. You can't understand me. I know you've only gotten three out of five words. All right. Ionian, <laughs> Ionians are one branch of the Athenian people, and there's a branch called Dorians. The Dorians are the branch that the Spartans come from. The Athenians thought of themselves as the mother city of the Ionians, and they claimed that all the Ionian Greeks are descended from Athens. The other Ionian Greeks kind of had to go, oh, well, maybe, you know. Okay, we're all Ionians. Maybe Athens is our mother city. So Athens has this relationship with the Ionian city-states. Sparta is definitely seen as a leading state of the Dorian Greeks, but there is a problem for Athens, and it's that they're surrounded by Dorians. Okay? Island of Igina, Dorian. City of Megara, Dorian. Corinth, Dorian. All right? The most important city-state at the time is Sparta, Dorian. And the other problem is that the Ionian Greeks over in Asia Minor are constantly getting defeated by other peoples like the Persians and the Lydians. So from an Athenian standpoint, being an Ionian was a little bit problematic because you look like the kind of Greek that gets defeated all the time. Meantime, you're surrounded by these Dorian guys like Sparta and their allies, and they seem to be doing pretty darn well. And the Athenians clearly felt this because sometime in this period, Athenian men who had been dressing in Ionian fashion, Ionian men, very stylish, all right, very Eastern styles, you know, very up with what's going on in Paris and Milan, you know, whole thing, skinny legs, and a whole deal, right? But the Athenian men decided, uh, you know, I don't know, this Ionian style, maybe we should start dressing like the Spartans. And Athenian men started affecting Spartan-style clothing, even to the point where they had been binding their hair up in these golden grasshoppers. They took the golden grasshoppers and they got rid of them. They didn't want to look Ionian anymore. Now, what does that tell you? They are Ionians, but they don't want to look Ionian anymore. They're surrounded by another kind of Greek that they see as very successful. I put it to you, there's something there that the Athenians are very un uncomfortable with. Maybe more even uncomfortable with this. Athens had a very weak, heroic, mythological tradition. Okay. So you, most people know, some, when they know something about the Greek world, they know about mythology. You know, they know something about Zeus, something about Hera, Aphrodite, you know. You know the story of the Trojan War and how this relates to the gods, etc. Something about this. And that was, that was the franchise. That's what I call it with my Greek, stu Greek Civ students at BU. That was the franchise. It was like the Star Wars franchise or the Star Trek franchise or the Marvel franchise or the DC franchise. It was the most important story and stories you could spin off from it in the ancient world. It dominated, okay? Well, here's the problem. Problem. Athens plays almost no role in it at all. Now that's tough, right? You grow up in this world where all Greeks are interested in this world and Athens doesn't play a role in it. The Iliad, okay, the most important piece of literature we have from the ancient Greek world. Homer's Iliad, if you, I know we have a couple of Homer experts in the audience here. I don't want you to answer this question. All right, but I'm going to ask everybody else in the audience. Can you tell me the name of the Athenian hero in the Iliad? I see no hands. Don't feel bad. I've asked it of every classics department I've spoken to for the last 20 years, including Ivy League departments, their entire faculty and graduate students, and not one person has been able to answer this question. Who is the Athenian hero in the Iliad? And you might be thinking, well, there must not be an Athenian hero in the Iliad. It's a trick question. No, I don't ask. Well, I do ask trick questions sometimes, but that's not a trick question. All right. There is an Athenian hero in the Iliad. His name is Menestheus. Don't feel bad that you don't know him. He is mentioned four times in the whole uh, epic. In a couple of those times, Agamemnon is telling him what a coward he is. Menestheus is known for being able to set men in order. That's his greatness. He knows how to set men in order. Right? Now think about the Iliad for a second. There's, pretty, there's guys that can do a whole lot of interesting stuff in the Iliad. They're killing guys left and right, setting up kingdoms, 
pillaging towns, you know, oh, but wrestling with gods. But Menestheus, he knows how to set men in order. Imagine how he must have vaunted, you know, after he set the men in order and he looked, look how orderly the men are. Am I not great? <laughs> Menestheus of Athens, he's a nothing in the Iliad. He's a middling nothing, okay? And the Athenians felt this acutely. I think I can prove this because in the historian Thucydides, when Pericles is making a speech to the Athenians, the famous funeral oration, which maybe some of you have read, Athens is at war with Sparta. It's the first year of that war. A bunch of Athenians have died in this war. And Pericles gets up to basically tell the Athenians why it's good to die for Athens, okay? And he makes an amazing speech in telling you why it's good to die for Athens and how you should fall in love with Athens every day and get hot for her. She's so hot, you've got to get hot for Athens. That's what it's all about. Yeah, he literally uses the language of, of physical attraction to describe the way Athenian citizens should feel about their city. All right? This is a war speech, do you understand? We're getting people excited about continuing this war, even though their brothers and their fathers and their cousins are dying. What kind of speech are you going to give in that situation? But one of the really weird things he says in that speech is, we don't need any Homer to sing our praises. What a weird thing for him to say in the middle of a political speech. We don't need any Homer to sing our praises. We're going to write our own epic. We're going to dominate. We will write our own epic, and we will forever be the heroes of it. You see, that's the message. We're going to leave monuments behind, he says, for good and evil wherever we go. People won't forget the name of Athens. We don't need any Homer. Why? Because we're not there. Homer. <laughs> and one of the funny ways this emerges is the Athenian's hero Theseus. Maybe some of you study mythology know about Theseus. Theseus is the guy who kills the Minotaur. You know the Minotaur, half bull, half man? They still teach you that story when you're in the fourth grade? Like, why? This scary story. They made us read Beowulf, and they told us about the Minotaur. I didn't sleep for three grades. Half man, half bull. <laughs> What the heck are we doing to 10-year-olds? Anyway, half man, half bull, Theseus has to go from Athens to save Athens from domination by Crete, the island of Crete. Now, this was a real weird story for the Athenians to tell in the 5th century BC because Crete was a nothing. All right? How was Athens ever dominated by Crete? This would be like telling the story of when we were dominated by Saskatchewan. Right, the Saskatchewanese came down and took us, and we had to send George Washington to overthrow <laughs> the evil Canadian monster, obviously. The, the story itself is a, is a reflection of the Athenians' admission and knowledge that there'd been a time where Athens was under the thumb of some other power, okay? But the Athenians attempt to build Theseus up into a, a hero like Hercules, okay, Heracles. That's basically what they're doing. Try to make Theseus into Heracles. And so Theseus has a bunch of labors that he performs, which are all remedial labors. He basically runs around doing the same thing Heracles did. Heracles kills the Marathonian bull. Theseus goes and kills the Marathonian bull. Theseus saves Athens from robbers. What a great thing. He saves Athens from brigands. He saves Athens from the Amazons. All right? Somehow he founds democracy in the mythological age of Athens. Anything you can throw onto Theseus, you're going to throw onto him, including he stole Paris before, he stole, hell, that would be amazing. He stole Helen before Paris did. Yeah, Paris steals Helen, goes to Troy, Trojan War. We got to get Theseus into the franchise somehow. So we'll have Theseus run off with Helen before Paris ever ran off with her. Now, Theseus is performing remedial labors, all right? Labors that try to raise Athens up to the status of the other great states in the mythological cycle, like Thebes, like Argos, like Sparta, yeah. So, Athens, in short, has, is, is I, I almost want to use the word suffering, and maybe I will use it, enduring some, some very interesting historical, economic, physical, geographical, uh, uh, environmental factors at the same time as these kind of psychological factors. We're an Ionian city-state, the Athenians, that's full of dynamism and interest in the new. That's one of the things associated with the Ionians. And you know what Thucydides has the Corinthians say about the Athenians is they're the kind of people who as soon as they think of something, they feel like they've gotten it, right? And they're on to the next thing, even before they really have it. The Athenians are the most dynamic people in the world. They're just, they're just takers, right? 
and they're taking the new and they're on to the next. And there's something quite powerful about that, but there's also something dangerous about it. It might lead you into some wars you don't want to be in. But they have that thing, but then they also have this Spartan resilience quality that the Athenians admired the Spartans, and they admired their conservatism, and they even admired the way they wore their hair. A real conservative Athenians went around with this long Spartan-style hair and affected Spartan clothes and used Spartan names. There's this admiration for the Spartan in Athens. Um, and then you combine that with this, you know, let's call it a, a kind of psychological need to establish themselves as equal to the rest of the Greek states. We do belong in Homer. We did have our own hero, hero Theseus, right? We're not a second tier status state. We are as great as Sparta. We are as great as Thebes. We are as great as Argos. This is the thing I think you have to keep in mind when you're looking at Athenian culture and history. You can't think of them as the Athenians we treat them as. In their own minds, they weren't that yet. In their own minds, they're the state that doesn't have the great heroes, that isn't in the Iliad, yeah? And it hasn't yet equaled the great states like Sparta, Argos, and Corinth. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank Jay, fabulous lecture. Thank you very much. Um, we now have time for Q&A. Uh, we've got two microphones. We'll have two microphones set up at the bottom. Uh, it's our tradition to take questions, the first three questions from students. So go ahead and start lining up, please, in the two rows and ask your questions for Professor Sammons. Great. Excellent. <laughs> Please. Yes, I'll be the first one. Um, hi, thank hi. you so much for being here. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm fascinated by your claim that a resistance to dualism is one of the things that made Athens and Greece so great. Um, one of my favorite books actually touches a lot on what you discussed and that the significance of Christ's physical body, etc. So I, I couldn't actually hear the, the book. You Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say the title of the book, okay. but um, it's Love Thy Body, I'm not sure if you're familiar, okay, no, but um, it, it discusses the significance of uh, rejecting dualism, mm -hmm. Christ's physical body, etc. So I'm curious how you see uh, dualism rearing its ugly head, so to speak, in the modern day America or even Athens, or if a, an acceptance of dualism led to any sort of decline. Yeah. Well, in, in, in the ancient world, it, it comes in most strongly in the early, early and middle and late Roman periods, um, where it comes in, in a pure form and also in various Christianized forms, like Gnostic Christians, st straight dualist Christians, and then Manichaeism, which many of you may have heard of, which is a, a religion that combines a lot of Persian dualist elements with Christian elements, with Jewish elements, and indeed with Greek philosophy as well. Um, I don't think the Greeks were quite... Uh, uh, in, the, in the period I'm describing here, I don't think they were aware of even that the fact that they were resisting this thing. I think their system of thought was just so based on the idea that our physical bodies are good, right? And in fact, an, a standard of goodness and beauty even, that, that the idea that the physical body could be evil would have been so, you know, uh, it, it had to come in a different way, yeah. Um, and so I think they resisted it unconsciously until you get to Plato. And by the late 5th uh, century and the 4th century, Plato is quite aware of this idea, I think. And of course, Plato's idea is that the whole reason anything exists is because there is this thing that is better than anything else, right? This thing, the one or the good. That's the thing that generates everything. And the physical world is something that emanates from that thing, right? And this is one of the reasons Platonism was so attractive to Christians. Because they said, okay, that sounds a lot like God to us. Like you're saying the physical world is actually exists because of this thing, right? And then you got Plato's interest in the soul, which also aligns. So the, the, I think the resistance to dualism, I think Plato is, is, is quite aware of it. And that's one of the ways it's resisted. One of the things that Christians used to fight dualism was Plato. So. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Will Lawson. I'm a junior here on the Lyceum Scholars Program. I really enjoyed your talk, Thank you. uh, probably as much as I did two years ago in yeah, Athens. I'm sorry you had to sit through it twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, um, but my question's more in the, the first half when you're in the broader sense talking about why Greece 
And mm -hmm. maybe this is just because my mind is being corrupted right now because we're reading Rousseau in class. <laughs> but <laughs> you asked, a, you, you, you made the claim of the Greeks started asking questions about culture and like what made the Phoenicians Phoenicians and maybe what made the Greeks Greek. And I was wondering how, if you could expand more on that and how far you would take that, take that in the sense of, do you think the Greeks had a greater sense of self or like a, a self-consciousness and, yeah. and how that would shape their culture and yeah. their development? What a great question. Um, I, this, this is something I've been uh, to toying with for the last three or four weeks. Because the older I get, the more I'm convinced that the Greeks had almost no conception of themselves as a, a separate, unique people until extremely late in their history. I mean, if you look at Greek poetry in the, in the 500s BC, for example, they're still talking about Lydia, okay? That's a non-Greek power in the middle of Asia Minor. They're still looking at Lydia and saying, oh, they got it great in Lydia, man. You know, that king over there and that culture over there and their art and their, it's so beautiful in Lydia, you know? That this idea of, of a kind of Greek superiority or Greek difference, okay, but they, they, it hasn't been cordoned off the way it's going to be later. And the Persian Wars definitely play a, 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 a role in that. Once the Persians start invading, you know, the Greeks start to say, well, one thing we're not is that, right? And if you go to, when you go to the Acropolis today, when you go up and look at the art on the Acropolis, just very simply, look at the stuff before the Persian Wars and the stuff after. And you will see that the stuff before looks almost like anything you could see in the Near East. It looks like uh, Assyrian art, it's sphinxes everywhere, it's guys with the fancy hair, it's the whole thing. And then after the Persian War, suddenly something has changed. The people look differently, they stand differently, the art is different. They, there's a sense of we've got to differentiate ourselves more. We haven't done that yet. So that's one thing. But the other thing is they were interested in this thing as, as the science of different peoples, right? And that arises in the, in the late 500s, early 400s BC. It, just at the big edge of this period. And, and I think once you start you know, defining what other peoples are, you eventually are going to come back and say, well, yeah, but we don't do that. You know? We're different in this way. Um, uh, and so you get a much clearer idea of what Hellenism means, of what Greekness means, after the Greeks start really examining other cultures closely, I think. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Chrysostom. I'm a history major here at Clemson. Hi. and. I think I might have a second logical decision that they made. You might have a what? A second logical decision that the Athenians made. So this depends, though, on if you believe that Demosthenes was pro-Athens or anti-Philip II. Was Athens intervening in Amphipolis logical? OK, was Athens helping uh, Amphipolis rational or yes. not helping? Helping. OK. So this is a, an excellent point. So Demosthenes in the fourth century uh, BC is an Athenian statesman who's arguing uh, before the Athenian people that Philip of Macedon is a dangerous character and he's a threat to us. So he makes a series of speeches in which he says, we better do everything we can to stop Philip while he's up in the north at Amphipolis, right? Um, and Philip had already, I would say, shown that he was aggressive. But Demosthenes had a very hard time convincing the Athenians that they needed to oppose Philip early enough, right? So what actually happens with, with uh, 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 Demosthenes is a failure, of course, to convince the Athenians to do this. It's only very, very late in his career that the Athenians are convinced to really mount the kind of uh, defense against Philip that they ought to. So I guess I would concede that the Athenians eventually do make a rational vote to oppose Philip. But it comes 10 years or more later than Demosthenes started arguing, we better oppose him now before he becomes too strong. And of course, by the time they do oppose Philip, he had knocked off all of their potential allies so that Athens was best, basically left stranded going to Thebes and saying, hey, Thebes, will you help us against Philip? And Thebes was Athens' traditional enemy. So the idea that Thebes was going to help them against Philip. So I think that you have a point. They do ultimately come to a rational decision about opposing Philip, but it took them way too long to get there. <laughs> all right, thank Thanks you. That's all. It. All right, folks, the floor is open uh, to anyone now. So um, unless I start seeing some people come down, I will start arbitrarily calling on you to come down and ask a question. So uh, yes, please. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, I want to sort of um, ask you to say more about your claim that Athenian sort of imperial and foreign policy was essentially irrational. That um, Athenian imperial policy was irrational? Essentially irrational. Hmm. Um, I mean, I'm sympathetic to that view, but if you take the city as a whole and what it achieved, it does seem like 
if the achievements we praise the city for are due in some way to this striving and dynamism and kind of, you know, inferiority complex going in all directions, that is it not in some way rational? Yeah. In some way kind of combined? Can you yeah. really separate out the, the vice of the imperialism and the overextension right. from right. the good things we get from them? Right. Well, I want to be fair to myself. I don't think I actually said that there, Athenian imperialism is irrational. I think you can make a rational case for Athenian imperialism. What you can't make a rational case for is the way they carried it out. For example, when they tried to invade Egypt and fight the Persians there at the same time as they started the first Peloponnesian War with, with Sparta and Corinth. Right? The, you can make a good case for Athens doing what it did with the other Greek states and that the wealth that they gained from their empire benefited Athens in all kinds of ways. I wouldn't argue against that. The moral question of it would be another thing entirely, okay? But the rational part of it, I'll concede. But the way they go about it is to kick themselves in the shin over and over and over and over again. I mean, the management of the empire and they're taking on another war, right? And when they're in the middle of one they probably can't win already is, I think, utterly irrational. Sir. All right, I'm, I'm Boone Sims. I'm Hi, a Boone. sophomore Lyceum scholar here. Um, so I'm sure you're aware, but there's the question going around, how often do you think about the Roman <laughs> Empire? But I'm not gonna ask you that question, but um, I would ask, um, my question is, would you compare the Roman and Greek civilizations um, in a little pitch for which do you think is greater and which deserves more thought? <laughs> That's a totally unfair question, but I'll answer it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I went to graduate school when, 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 when Brad and I were young and happy men. Uh, I, I, uh, I wanted to be a Roman historian um, and was convinced that I would. Greece just seemed too small to me. The whole thing was like a tempest in a teacup, you know. Um, so it was really the studying of Greek literature, and Thucydides in particular, that made me decide I was wrong about that. So I had to be converted, essentially, from a Roman historian to a Greek historian. Um, so I went, just like most converts, I became a zealot. Right, so now I b absolutely believe that uh, you know, Greece is so superior. I, I teach Roman history. I, I love especially later Roman history, the late Roman Republic too, and I admire it greatly. But I do think that, that Rome, Rome, thinking of Rome is thinking generally about institutions. Right? The Romans created all kinds of institutions and processes, engineering, you know. Greece is something, the Greeks are something, there's something spiritual there. There's, there's an ideal, I think, inherent in Hellenism. You know, nobody talks about Romanism, right? That's not a word. Mm -hmm. You never hear, well, that really shows Romanistic values. Now, you might say Republican values, but Hellenism is a word, right? And Hellenism captures something. So um, the Romans were perfectly well aware of this. You know, like Nietzsche says, well, the, the Romans weren't really second tier to the Greeks and imitating the Greeks. They were doing their own thing. You know, OK, that's true in maybe one area, satire. But basically, the Romans were so convinced that Greek culture was superior that they took the Latin language, which did not scan in the same way that the Greek language did, and they forced it into the meters of Greek poetry. And for, for example, Latin abhors an accent on the final syllable. Greek loves accents on the final syllable. Yeah? And the Romans were just like, well, that's what poetry is like. So we'll just shoehorn Latin into Greek meter. And that's literally what they did. All right. So anybody that tells me that the Romans themselves didn't recognize Greece as culturally superior, you know, then I'm just going to have a little Thank difficulty. You. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hello, Dr. Sammons. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding what you told us about the like silver mines and how people went. The mines. Yes. Okay. How people went from getting that money in their own pockets to then providing for like the Athenian fleet. So from that story, what do you think we can take as a current lesson about <laughs> the balance between personal gain and profit and like providing for the common good? Well, that's what a great question. That's not a question I wanted to get at all. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, well, you know, I spent the first eight years or 10 years of my career writing about what the Athenians did with their money, where it came from and, and where it went. Um, and one thing they did was to spend, expend it on wars, buildings, and debt. And the Athenians overspent themselves to the point that when they were in the Peloponnesian War, they racked up a debt of about 6,000 talents to the goddess Athena. Now, the goddess Athena is a very, very forgiving creditor. Uh, for example, she lowered the interest rate during the Peloponnesian War from about 6% to about 1.5%, which I think was quite reasonable of her. <laughs> Thank you, Athena. Um, and the Athenians, by the way, never repaid that money that they took from the sacred uh, wealth of Athena. Um, so 
if you track, this is a project for, for the Clemson Institute, in fact, I think this is a great project. If you track, I put it to you, debt against democracy. Devise whatever system you want for the, the most democratic system, all right? And then you track debt against that in various cultures. They will track at almost a one-to-one -one rate. That the more democratic, defined as you will, generally there will be more debt. Um, and that was true from the moment the Athenians found a way to spend money that wasn't theirs. <laughs> and politicians will also use that as a way to get votes. I mean, this is what Pericles does in the middle of the fifth century. He stands up and says, hey, I think we should pay you guys to serve in office. Nobody had ever suggested that before. And of course, the Athenians went, that sounds like a great idea. Just that money's going to come to us now. We're going to get paid for serving in office. And so how do you argue against that? And the guy that, the people who oppose that disappear from the political scene. And so it becomes in Athens a question of how much are you going to get paid, right? Instead of the question of it's imprudent for us to operate that way, we shouldn't, for example, leave debt to our children to pay or grandchildren or whatever. No, it becomes a, we're going to satisfy ourselves right now. And that idea, as soon as it appears on the historical stage, is impossible to remove, it seems to me. And it's closely connected to democracy. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Professor Salmon. Uh, Andrew Gross, I'm teaching here at the Clemson Institute. And, uh, I'm sorry, I can Pardon me, you. Andrew Gross, uh, teaching here at the Clemson Institute. Ah, uh, nice to meet you. And a uh, pleasure indeed. Um, thank you so much for that. That was riveting. Thank you. And um, I, a number of questions, uh, uh, sort of uh, quarter baked, come to mind. But I thought I'd ask you was one of the, one of the arguments, um, is it fair to put it this way, that you've got this sort of psychological insecurity on the part of the uh, on the, on the part of the Athenians. Um, they don't have uh, a place really in the Iliad. Um, there isn't much uh, for, um, to be said with respect to the Olympians, uh, relatively speaking. Um, although, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's actually one question, where they stand with respect to the Olympians. But, um, so there, there's one. Um, but I was wondering if uh, all these irrational decisions that they were making during the Pel Peloponnesian War, as you described them, could, uh, could come down to this sort of psychological insecurity, that they, they're sort of macho men, they're trying to uh, compensate for, for this insecurity? Is that, is that one element? And then well, I thought I'd just throw in something, a <laughs> quick question about the archaeology in Thucydides and, and yeah. um, how the, the, the loss of piety might figure into uh, I, the, loss of, the, the loss of piety that he describes in the archaeology Thucydides I, I'm sorry, I can't actually hear. The uh, excuse me, piety. Piety. Yes, piety. sir, yeah. So okay. I'll leave it at that. All right. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you. Um, well, I didn't use the word compensate. I just want to say that. Um, uh, look, I am not a psychologist, uh, and I'm just taking the, the literature as it comes to me. Um, and, and reading it, I think, I'm trying to read it sensitively through the eyes of people of the time as much as I can, instead of looking back. You know, the funeral oration of Pericles where he says, we don't need any homework. You know, I don't know that anybody has really tried to read that from the standpoint of how it would have sounded in the fifth century BC as opposed to how it sounds to us. Well, of course we think Athens doesn't need a Homer because we know what Athens became. But in 431 BC, nobody knows what Athens is gonna come. She's in a struggle for her existence, she thinks, or dominance with Sparta, yeah? Um, and Pericles has an earlier speech in Thucydides where he says, we must teach the Spartans to treat us as equals. That's a really interesting thing to say. Right? Does, do you see how that shows where you are? If you're a politician and you get up and say, we have to teach this other state to treat us as equals, you're admitting that, they, that we're somehow fighting to get up to that level. Right? We're trying to punch above our weight, as it were. Um, so, but what the psychological effects, I mean, is this an individual phenomenon? Is it a cultural phenomenon? I mean, I can say it's a cultural phenomenon. I think it obviously is. The Theseus thing, the Homer thing to me, make just make it clear but how much that affected any individual Athenian you know or did it just make the Athenians as a group liable to to this kind of rhetoric when you hear everybody say we don't need any Homer yeah we sure don't you know um, on the religious thing the piety and the Olympian gods uh, of course Athena you know the word Athens means Athenas plural and in Athens they worshiped many Athenas Athena Polias uh, uh, Athenian Promachos, Athenian Niki, all right? Lots of versions of Athena that get worshipped in Athens. So Athens is the place. They have a festival, the Pan-Athenea, the All-Athenia Festival. 
So, you know, you would think Athena Festival, all Athena Festival, you, you would think that Athena in the Iliad and the Odyssey, that, that this would make, because she plays a very important role in both poems, and you would think that this would have given ample opportunity to introduce Athens into a more important role in the poems. And it's true, Athens has a little more important role in the Odyssey. But still, the idea that the, po the poems have been manipulated to show more Athens, which some people have argued, I find to be a laughable claim. Because had you had manipulated the Iliad to show more Athens, you wouldn't have only four mentions of this hero, Menestheus, and have him called a coward. You'd have him actually do something other than set men in order, which we never even see him do. He just says, I set men in order. Right? Surely one thing could have been introduced to the text to make Athens seem greater. And the thing they claim is, well, Ajax from the island of Salamis launches or, or uh, parks his ships next to the Athenian ships. This is the claim that classicists make for Homer's poem having been manipulated to show that Athens is great because the great Ajax, right, the great hero next to Achilles, the greatest hero on the Greek side, he brings his ships and he parks them next to the Athenian ships. Oh, how they've changed the poem. Do you see how they brought Athens up and made her so great because Ajax parks his ships next to the Athenian ships? The idea is ludicrous that that's an Athenian manipulation. Um, so I think because of this connection with Athena, we ought to see much more of that kind of stuff in the, in the Iliad and Odyssey. Well, I guess it's fate that I get to ask the last question. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, can you connect your talk on the rise of Athens uh, with the rise of philosophy? Hmm. Well, it's good you didn't ask a hard question. Um, I, I think so. Um, and. The Ionians that I talked about in the 500s BC, these are people like Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, the guys who came up with the ideas like the earth is consists, everything is made of water, everything is made of fire, everything is made of air. Introducing this rational approach, right, which was we can answer the most important questions with our mind. Our human mind. You see, that's different from a revealed religion which says God is going to tell you what he's like. You're not going to sit around asking yourself, what, it, how, how, do, how's the, how, how does, what is God like? God is going to appear in a burning bush, all right? And he's going to tell you what he wants you to do. And his name is going to be I Am, all right? There's no thought about that. You have to accept that, all right? Moses finds it a little difficult, but he ultimately accepts it, yeah? So this is, is a different way of thinking about the world. And the Greeks' idea that, well... We can actually ask these important questions and we can come up with an answer to them. You see how this ultimately gets us to Plato. Because if you start out asking what the world is like, and this is what they did, then they started asking like, what are people like? What are people in groups like? What are the Persians like? What are the Egyptians like? What are the Greeks like? And then by the end of the fifth century, they're asking, what is a human being like? So we have medical writing appears by the middle, late fifth century. So the Hippocratic corpus comes up and we go, well, there's this stuff inside of us and it's red and it seems to be connected with our living and there are other things, organs that seem to be doing things. And right, so the interest in the, in the physical stuff of man and then Plato comes along and says, well, then what's the next question? And the next question is, what is inside of that? All right, what's the motivating thing inside of that? What is the soul? And you may be someone that doesn't believe in the soul and that's fine, but they had a reason to believe in the soul and the reason is, how do you make decisions? How do you make decisions? Just ask yourself that question. Are you not sometimes torn between two things where you want one thing and you want another thing? Right? And you want them both. Does it not feel like there are two things inside of you going, I want this and I want that? And how can that be? I am one thing. How can I want two things? <laughs> There's something else. I must consist of different parts. So you see, this is exactly where Plato goes. The soul has to consist of separate parts because we experience its warring with itself. Yeah? So the, the Platonic philosophy, I think, is the, just the next extension of this question of answering, what is everything? Well, never did I think that 37 years ago I would be introducing you to 250 students at Clemson University. <laughs> Uh, so this is genuinely uh, a great moment in my career, and I just want to tell all the students here, you've just witnessed one of the best lectures you'll ever see in your <laughs> lives, and I'd like you to join me in thanking Professor Sammons. Thank you, Brad. Thank you.